Okay, so welcome back. And so, of course, we're going to start out with the same way we always start out, which is, has anybody done their homework? But the question for the first day after the summer is, does anybody know what the homework is so that we can set that? Yes, Mr. Vale, Elder Mr. Vale. To share the gospel was one. And read the chapter. Okay, so that is your homework in perpetuity for the rest of the Sunday school year is to read the chapter and share the gospel. Right? And when we finish John sometimes in 2050, uh, we're, we'll actually not do the read the chapter part because I think I might go into something like uh, church history or systematic theology or hermeneutics. I think I might branch into one of those. And I'm not sure if I'll base them in a book or if I'll just do a course, a lecture course. Anyways, but the, the other one, sharing the gospel, will always be part of the homework. Okay, so the question, of course, is then, is... Who, over the course of the summer, got an opportunity to share the gospel? And what are the requirements in sharing the gospel as far as our class is concerned? Okay, can you just throw a gospel track at somebody out of a moving vehicle and hit them and call that sharing the gospel? If somebody sneezes and you say, God bless you, is that sharing the gospel? No. Okay, so what did you have to do according to the class requirements to share the gospel? You, have, you actually have to communicate with the person. And it can't be on Facebook. Well, I, get, I, I will put some caveats for the electronic side of things because if you're obviously in, on Messenger or something with somebody far away and you actually... Uh, share the gospel with them, then I will count that. But if it's just a general conversation and, and God happens to be mentioned, that does not count. What do you have to do to share the gospel with somebody and it count for the class? Or really count at all? Anywhere in the world, if you communicate over messenger or text or the telephone or anything with somebody anywhere in the world, then and you share the gospel with them, then that counts. I, I've been emphasizing sharing the gospel. So what would have to be included in the gospel for it to count? Repentance and faith. Right. Or just belief. You have to believe would not count, though. You have to have an object for the belief. Right? So you have to <coughs> have the ABCs, right? Uh, you have to have the admission of sin, right? You have to have belief in Jesus Christ and a confession of belief, right? So you have to actually uh, repent. You have, they, you have to tell them they need to repent of their sins. You have to tell them that they need to believe in the life, work, and, and uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Man, I'm failing at the gospel myself on a Sunday morning. This is terrible. Right? You guys can help me out. Right? So you have to believe in the life, work, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you have to uh, have, have given your life over to Christ. Okay? So that's what you have to tell them that they need to do. Right? You have to tell them the requirements of the gospel. I say do, and all those people who don't like work salvation are going, Ah, that's terrible. You don't have to do anything. You just have to believe. But you have to give them what they need to believe, and what needs to take place. Okay? Everybody got that? So no 
God bless you, no just saying, oh, God loves you, none of that. It has to be a full presentation of the gospel. Having said that, did anybody do that over the summer? What's that? We're moving on, Dallas. You, you had your opportunity to, to give an accurate definition of the gospel. Well, uh, hopefully the school requirement and what the Bible teaches will line up together. <laughs> right, that's what it says. What's that? What does it mean to believe? There is a more encompassed in that, and obviously even in that passage, they, they didn't leave it at that. They, they uh, elaborated on that teaching, right? So that people come to a full understanding of the gospel, um, what it means to be saved. Okay, so Eli said that he had an opportunity, and you, you, you don't have to share what happened, but, but it is encouraging to others if you do so. I did share the gospel message with a lot of kids at camp working over the summer, and one kid specifically didn't make a commitment to believe in Christ, but definitely asked some tough questions and sounded like they were thinking about it. Good. That's excellent. Yeah, and, and that's another thing is that planting the seed, right, we do not save anybody, and if you give the gospel and the person rejects it or the person says they're going to think about it or the person accepts it, all those things are acceptable for uh, points in the class. They will count towards your final grade. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> I shared the gospel at camp over the summer as well. And... Um, I did two weeks. Does this count? Chapel messages? <laughs> I am going to count. If you did a teaching, yeah, I'm desperate. <laughs> if, you did, if you did teaching where you shared the gospel, then that's good. But don't give every individual occurrence. Just say, I taught at this and I shared the gospel with a group of people. That is sufficient. Okay? But I did have one follow one kid came up to me, well teenager came up to me after speaking in Newfoundland and he wanted to know it was a, after my last chapel, he came up and he wanted to know more and he had some some deep questions. And so I got to have a one on one conversation with him after the last chapel. And I just spent time praying with him. So I got to I guess that conversation was really about clarifying the gospel. Like just Going, going deeper into what it means to trust in Christ and so kind of a follow-up. Follow -up, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, so I find uh, it's very hard to say it's a, most of my gospel encounters are not the whole it takes a few different weeks of encounters. But this week alone there was one encounter where I was paying a customer at a bill uh, I was taking them, they pay me in cash, so I opened my wallet and I had one of those uh, Charles Spurgeon million dollar bill things. Right. Yep. So I had a conversation about that, but rarely, rarely do I jump right in to the whole thing in the gospel message. Often, I had another encounter with uh, another business owner who was uh, really, really down because they had something like 7,200 tires stolen. I watched them on their cameras as it was getting stolen. The police said they put the kind of a key holder on the property. I kid you not. So, but, so they're really, really down with this. I'm about the evil in the world, and I talk about my church family, and I talk about, uh, and I have talked about the, the gospel message about Jesus before. So I say, this usually come in. This was a, a low point, and I invite her here to. Here. So it's, it's usually a mix. It's often encounters at multiple levels. Yeah, we're not taking this either. No, the, if we're talking about the you know last message of the track, yes, there's one one there where it's kind of encapsulated in the whole thing. But uh, that's that kind of I have no idea about the backstory or anything. So, so you do get one point because you did share the gospel, and 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 yeah, you are all to be. Salt and light, right? So your conversation should be God-oriented, and if it isn't, you guys should adjust your conversations because your conversation should always be 
uh, you know, correcting the false philosophies and wisdom of this world. So that is a good thing, and we all should be doing that. But there are those rare gems that are presented to you by God that are times when you can give a full gospel presentation to a person. Those are pretty exciting, right? And, and it's because those are pretty exciting and encouraging to everybody that that's, that's where I want to go with that. That's what I want you to bring uh, to the Sunday school class to share with everybody <coughs> because, you know, in my experience, when I share the gospel... It is exciting, and it always hits me that why don't you do this more often? It is such a wonderful experience, right? Even when it's rejected, even when people mock you and such, it is good to share the gospel. It is, it, it's obedience, for starters, go into all the world and share the gospel. So it's a good thing to do, and it feels good because when we do what is right, we feel Good. It's, it's part of who we are. It's part of our nature. And so that feels good. And when you share it, share that experience with others, it's an encouragement for them to go and do likewise, right? So that's what I want to encourage in the classroom, uh, in, in the Sunday school class, is those experiences. Corey, you were going to say something? <clears throat> it's what? Yes, yes absolutely. So I, I, I give you an example. Like I, I at at work I try to be a good witness, and uh, and I try and structure my conversation appropriately and point towards God. But I don't always share the gospel. One, <coughs> work is not structured that way. One, I work alone a lot, and two. It, it's it's difficult to steer conversations in that direction sometimes, a lot of the time. So, but but uh, right around the time Dad passed away, I was up working with a guy, and and he's a really really rough character. But I got to s- sit in a room, God orchestrated conditions so that it was just me and him in a room, and and the conversation was such that I could talk to him about Christ. And I got to share full gospel presentation, answer lots of questions, and it was a wonderful experience. And I was very thankful to God to give me that gift, especially at that time when I was mourning over Dad. So it was really exciting to be able to share. And the guy was very receptive. He very, he, you know, he asked lots of questions and clarification, and uh, you know, he he certainly gave me the indication that he was going to think about it and mull over it and that it had challenged his preconceptions about what being a Christian was all about. So that was that was really good and I was really encouraged by that. Anybody else before we move on? Well like I feel like our friends failure to know is a big behavioral changes in us today. I feel like it's extremely hard to segue into Repent of your sins, but, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes, I don't know if we're supposed to do that more often, or if it's just, like, like you said, just be salt and light with every conversation and every action, and represent the joy and peace that God put in your heart, you know? So, but then, like, you know, and I have noticed it affect other people, when people ask questions and stuff, but, um, I guess it would be nice to see someone go a little further, too, and I don't know how to help them that for and when, you know what I mean? So it's just kind of a little tidbit, I guess, like Mike was saying. Yeah, You're absolutely, anybody want to comment on that? Because that's a really good question. Like, um, I guess the way to put it is, how pushy are we supposed to be, right? How pushy should you be in... Uh, Pointing, and there are lots of different perspectives on this. There are uh, people who have the attitude that you shouldn't come away from any conversation without telling somebody the full gospel. And then there are people who are 
Uh, you know, unless the person asks you point blank, what is the gospel? What must I do to be saved? You don't share the gospel because that's being too in your face. So there are those two extremes of, of viewpoints. And, uh, and the question is, I'm just going to throw it out here, is how pushy should we be? can be a hard one. Sometimes you give the person both barrels because it, it depends a lot on your relationship with the person. And, and the, the proverb says, like apples of gold in settings of silver are words spoken in season, right? Meaning that it's timing, right? And I like what Micah said because we don't want to get into doing things on our own, independent of God's leading. The Spirit is essential, right? And so prayer is obviously a big factor, whether it's a person that you're sitting beside on an airplane, or whether it's a person you've been working beside for five years, you want that opportunity that is orchestrated by God. And, but obviously, as Christians, we understand that this is an eternal kind of thing and this person is you don't want this person to die without the knowledge of the gospel right that is why the command is to go into all the world and preach the gospel is we don't want that person to die without that knowledge but we also want to be effective and so we want to be in constant communication with our Lord God and Savior, that he would open those doors and present those opportunities, and we would be sensitive and obedient to his leading. Right? So we have an imperative, a zeal, and you should, as a Christian, to share the gospel with everybody. Right? But we are not supposed to be purposefully offensive. The gospel is offensive to the lost enough without us working to be offensive on our own, <laughs> right? So we want to take those opportunities and make those opportunities in concert with God, right? Is that clear? Any questions about that? My experience that I had was with my physical therapist for five months from April until just recently. And how God made it so much easier for me to talk to her about him. He sent me somebody that looked just like Hannah Myers. <laughs> and her bubbly personality and her sweetness. <laughs> and it made me so easy that that first week I was able to let her know that my husband and I were Christians. And what we did and how we <laughs> becoming Christians. And... She um, she was just a sweetheart. So that was the first week. And then every week I managed to get a little bit more about my testimony and how how we came about. And then she she said that she, she was pregnant. 
and she was 45, and now they take that as a geriatric. Yes. Yes. Yeah. She did what? <laughs> last plug I'll put in is that one of the things we often forget and uh, and I God has really been impressing upon this upon me is that we're very especially in our society very individualistic right and it is much easier to live out your faith it is much easier to share the gospel it is much and it is designed as such by God that we do it together right and so if you're in a place where you have another Christian with you then it is good to partner with them right to be with them in sharing the gospel and in living out your faith and your conversation should be Christ honoring right and so you are a much brighter testimony to the world and you have much more uh, effective ministry in the world if you're together than if you're singular, right? And that is something to keep in mind that you want to make, you want to make use of your brothers and sisters because that's what they're there for, right? In encouragement, in comfort, all of it, right? In strength. <laughs> Okay, we're almost done, the introduction to the homework. <laughs> so say, Sam was saying like the first three weeks of Sunday school is just going to be a uh, recap, and I laughed, and, but he was right. <laughs> it, it might be three weeks of recap. So any other questions about the homework? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got enough of that, Sam. Okay, so what book are we perpetually going through? John, yeah, we're going through John forever. And uh, so we are going to do a recap. I looked, I looked at my notes and I went, uh, oh, here's the recap from 2022, right? So we've been at this for what, this is year number four? Is this year number four? 
I think it is. So if the recap was 2022, then we must have been doing it in 2021. Oh, yeah, it was a pandemic. So we weren't doing Sunday school during the pandemic. So were we doing it in 2020? Yeah, it was pandemic too. Right. So 2021, we might have been back to Sunday school. So we probably did it 2021, 2022, 2023, and this is 2024. (laughs) So this is the fourth year for the fourth gospel. So this is perfect. We'll end up the fourth gospel in the fourth year. I like that. That's symbolic somehow. All right. So we are going to go over, uh, because we have some new people, and I want you guys to answer all of these questions on your own because you've learned all this. So we're going to go over the introduction to the fourth gospel. Okay, and we're going to start right from the beginning. Who wrote the gospel of John? John. How do we know that? I miss Hendrick. He, he, he has all the controversial stuff that you'd say, you know. I was going to say German higher criticism, but that would be a nasty insult, so we'll stay away from that. Okay, who wrote that? John, why do you believe that? Does it say it? Does it say, I, John the Apostle, being of sound mind and body, hereby write to you the gospel about Jesus Christ? No? Good, an- good question. Does it? Why? Who refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved? Who dis- who Jesus loved? John does? How do you know that? <laughs> okay. Anybody familiar with circular arguing? Yeah. There we go. Okay, the, the Gospels, by and large, do not give you their names. Like, I, Matthew, wrote this. I, Mark, wrote this, right? So, there is a bit of tradition involved in, in the church's understanding of who wrote them. Yes, sir? It's called the Gospel of John. <laughs> yes, it, it certainly is. Again? Traditionally, it is ascribed to John, but there's some reasons. We don't just say, hey... I like John, and I want him to have a gospel. So I'm going to say John wrote this one. Because this seems like what I would think he would write. Right? So, but we are really confident that it is John that wrote this gospel. Okay, yes, Elizabeth? I found something at the very end of the book. So, at the very end of the book, this is the disciple who's bearing witness about Okay, so it's a disciple who Jesus loved, and it's an eyewitness. That is evidence that John is not mentioned in this gospel is also evidence. So we're going to talk about two forms of evidence, which we talked about before, and we're going to do this quickly because this is a recap. And we got external evidence and internal evidence. So internal evidence is the evidence within the text that gives us indications about who wrote this gospel. And one of the evidences is is that John is never mentioned. Now, is John a prominent figure in the gospel narratives? Absolutely, right? So he is one of the twelve, but he's also one of the very inner core. We know that from the synoptics. We'll get on the synoptics in a second. Okay, so he's one of the inner core of the apostles, of the disciples of Jesus Christ, and yet he's never mentioned by name in this gospel. So one of two things has to be true. One is that whoever did write it hated John, right? He had to hate John. He edited him right out of the text. Or... If it was John, he did not want to refer to himself by name, right? As a sign of humility. But he did put himself in there because it's hard to avoid him. He put himself in there as the disciple Jesus loved, right? And 
that's a pretty good way to refer to yourself without referring to yourself. Right? So we have that kind of, of evidence that he isn't included. The other evidence was that he was uh, an eyewitness. Whoever wrote this had to be an eyewitness. And not just an eyewitness, but an eyewitness of the things that were very intimate in the life of Christ and in the ministry of Christ, right? So he had this insight into things that took place behind closed doors that only one of the twelve and at times only one of the three would be privy to. That they would be the only ones who would have this kind of information. And so that's also strong internal evidence. What else is strong internal evidence? Yes, Corey. I don't know if you said this already, but the resurrection account in John chapter 20, when uh, Peter and John, we know from the Synoptic Gospels, it was Peter and John who ran to the tomb. But in this, in John's Gospel, it says, Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. So, so we've got things that occurred in the Synoptics that we know who did it, right? And then they occur in the Gospel of John, but John's never mentioned, right? But we know who that person was. So if we put two and two together, right? It's John, obviously. Okay, stylistically, it's John kind of style because we have a label on the epistles of John and the style matches up, especially 1 John and the Gospel of John are, you know, the, the content is almost mirrored, right? It's right there. So we have those kind of internal evidences that we also have other things like, obviously it was a Palestinian Jew because he knows all about Palestine. He was obviously a Jew because he knows all about the festivals and all about uh, Jewish customs. And so there's, you have all these things that indicate uh, it was obviously a person that would fit John's description. Right? So... There are some other things, but I think we'll leave it there for the internal evidence. So there's enough internal evidence to really make a very, very, very strong argument, a conclusive argument, if you ask me, that it was John, the apostle, that wrote this. What about external evidences? Does anybody remember any of the external evidences? Yes, ma'am. My Bible says that Arminius testified on behalf of Polycarp that John wrote it. Who was Irenaeus? An early church father. <laughs> okay, so Irenaeus, he wrote a, a very famous book called Against Heresies, right? But he was a disciple of a disciple of John, right? So he had, you know, some secondhand information, but very close to the original source. And he wrote that John wrote this book in Ephesus. Right at the end of his life. So, so the external evidence, which is not just that some of the heretics said it was John, and uh, some of the early church fathers said it was John, so the consensus from the church has consistently attributed this gospel to John. Right? So, those who knew John passed on to their disciples that it was John, and the consensus of the church uh, pretty much universally stated very, very early on that this was the Gospel of John. And of course we have uuh, some fragments of the Gospel of John early on to show that it was authentic, but we're going to leave the authenticity of the Gospel out. We've covered that in previous, but we want to go to authorship and timing and stuff like that. And we're pretty much out of time, and we haven't even got through the authorship. We have location, time, purpose, themes, stuff like that left to go. So, you know, in four weeks, we should be actually back to the text. So, anyways, we are done for this morning. Thank you.